Thank you very much. We know what's going on in Paris and we, we know how, well, thank you very much to Lafka for the kind words on our initiative. Uh, you are not aware, but uh, yesterday we submit another application for Horizon 2020. Uh, so our, uh, our institution is ready to a new challenge under the European flag and uh, asking for support of the European Commission for an additional step in the energy efficiency initiative. Uh, we will be discussing, as I say, this in Venice, where we would like to bring this industry to the creation of a proper label with also an IT protocol or support or a transparency model that can help the banks in demonstrating to investors that they are real green. So this is uh, moving ahead, and I'm sure that in a few months' time we can update you on developments from our side. But allow me to present our uh, guest today. Um, we wanted to have a mix between... Uh, people of the ECBC who played a very important role in the negotiation for the directive and key players on the institutional side that has, uh, I would say, helped the market to move ahead. We all are aware that uh, this directive was a major challenge. There was, a, a, I would say, a very difficult political balance that had to be find, uh, found. Uh, and the Commission, I think, that, uh, and the, the European Banking Authority, they found the right balance. Um, maybe I would like to ask uh, uh, our chairman of the different working group if you would like to start the debate by trying to see where we are and what are the challenges that we see as an industry in front of us. Frank has a new role. Frank had uh, the funniest role in the ECBC at the, at the, in the moment because he is uh, the coordinator of our implementation task force. So he had already his dose of fun a Monday, uh, a Monday afternoon. So maybe if you can give us a, a flavor of what is the, the feelings in the market. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have the pleasure to be the, the moderator of the uh, implementation task force. And it's really about moderating. And uh, as you can imagine, we have all national representatives from the issuer perspective um, really being together and trying to understand what is the meaning of the cover bond directive, what is the meaning of the cover bond regulation. So, for example, um, I think on Monday we had a discussion about Article 17, that's maturity uh, extension. So what does it mean to have a, a qualitative or objective uh, trigger included in, in, in the legal framework? What does it really mean? And I think that was like a really interesting discussion. And I think so the idea is really to, to tackle all the, the, the key problems, the key issues we see uh, from an from a issue perspective and, and really try to, to understand really what is the meaning and I think we were surprised to see how many questions uh, suddenly pop up and, and, and try to understand. And we had, for example, also like discussion about uh, derivatives. Uh, what is the right evaluation of derivatives? Because you, you need to use that for the uh, calculation of the coverage. And uh, do you use the nominal value? Do you use some kind of net value? Uh, and it's also like, does it account for your limit you have on credit institutions. I think those aspects is something what we would like to discuss from the industry perspective. And uh, there was really a lot of, of different different aspects or different views on that. And uh, I think we want really to, to try to, to help uh, all the national representatives to, to really get a proper understanding of that. And uh, they're, they're still, although it's, it's not long, the, the cover bond directive or cover bond regulation, there's still a lot of, of question marks and then uh, people with different views. And I think that's what we are trying to moderate there. And I think we started initially with what we call a, a traffic-like system, where we try to, to understand um, if you take like Article 2, who has to make changes, or who's happy already with, with what they have in the legal framework, and uh, do they have to do like big changes or small changes? And I think it was quite interesting to see that. But we're also realizing quickly it's all it's sort of a lot of political issues, and, and I think everybody has to agree on a certain standard if you use some kind of traffic-like model and, and highlighting where some kind of, of need to, to make adjustment to the law. And I completely, coming from an analyst perspective, I thought that's a sensible approach. Copying the, the, the uh, approach from the EBA, but I think with best practice guidelines, used a similar approach. I thought, okay, that's a good starting point. But soon I realized it's a lot of political issues, and I think... At a certain point, we want to also highlight it, um, that the top five challenges, and I picked the name challenges, and then people said, ah, actually, challenge is maybe the, 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 the wrong word, and, and because sometimes it's not a challenge, we have to only have to address some of the points, and I think we have to, to change the language a bit, and now we've been talking about uh, points which is worth mentioning in the uh, 
like be, be considered in the, in the task Re force. So you can see re 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 reflection, reflection points. points. We agree that I still have to get used to, to the new term. So as you can see, uh, but it also shows like how political this whole thing is. But I think um, that was one aspect. This whole political discussion. But on the um, subject, I think it was really, really helpful and everybody enjoyed it and, and really got, got a really good understanding. And it's, it's amazing to have really like a broad range of people there and, and, and really give them different views. And for example, I mentioned before, we, we were talking about the objective triggers. Then uh, I think uh, we, we got like the feedback from Estonia say, oh, I really included in our law. So I think all these aspects is something which is really, really useful and, and hopefully uh, helps also then the national representatives in the discussion with the, with the regulators and, and, and maybe allow a little bit of harmonization. Um, okay, I talked already for a long time, but maybe I was a little bit surprised to get like the your your your, your speech because I thought, okay, now it's like the, the, this is a big thing. We have to cover one directive, and and now everybody's thinking about the national implementation. And, and listen to your your speech. You you pointed out, oh, maybe there could be additional additional changes and and. And new requirements, and you're not happy with the harmonization level at the moment. And I, I was really almost shocked because I thought, okay, now we have this uh, really, in, in my view, more than we expected. I think before we said like like it's almost like a hands-off approach from the regulators, and now we saw the carbon bond directive and was really detailed. Of course, there is a little bit room for national discussion, but I was really surprised to to see that you mentioned that okay, there could be the next step then of, of more regulation. I think at the moment the industry really have to digest this and have to make adjustments and we're thinking about what, what our kind of transition routes are in place. But if you like indicating there could be the next wave of, of changes, I think probably the market will get a little bit nervous. Yeah, maybe I would like to ask also Morton to remove his head of the CBC, but maybe also give us a sense of uh, like a traditional country like Denmark which is a very special uh, for, for, for the carbon bond perspective, how they are uh, seeing the implementation of the directive and, uh, and uh, what are the opportunities and the challenges that you see from a national point of view? Well, we are, we are of course, waiting for the final text, uh, even though we have, of course, been involved in the, uh, in the, in the process and, and have seen all the drafts. So, uh, but... Um, from what I hear from various sources, there could there could still be some uh, last-minute changes in the in the wording as the uh, as the original text gets translated into the uh, national uh, national languages. Having said that, we are of course uh, preparing for the for the implementation, and we have started uh, a dialogue with the Danish regulator. Of course, I think overall, from a Danish perspective, we do not expect to see huge changes in the legislation. Um, Based on the EBA's um, best practice approach, you would see that that there was not a lot of fields where 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 there seemed to be um, uh, where we seem to be lacking behind. Uh, but having said that, it's always when you go to an implementation uh, phase, uh, regulators will sit down and read the new directive and compare to the to the existing uh, national legislation and, and and come up with is this still in line. Um, so, um, so we will, of course, expect to see some work in there. Um, but again, we don't expect massive changes in the, uh, in, the in the Danish legislation. Um, I think overall, we are we are quite happy with the directive as it has uh, has turned out. I think, from uh, which is more my my personal opinion, I have always found it very difficult to understand how we could have a definition of a covered bond that sat in in a directive which had nothing to do with covered bonds, namely the usage. Uh, so from that perspective, I think, I think this, is a, this is clearly a step forward. Uh, I think it would make it much easier for newcomers to sit down and figure out what is a covered bond. Uh, in my daytime job, I take care of investor relations. I think it would be much easier for, for, for all of us in the community to say, look, you can just read the directive. It's all in here. Um, yes, you need a little bit of technical knowledge to actually see behind the some of these uh, these sections, but however, you can get a pretty good picture of what what you are actually looking at um, with with this directive. So I, I think I think we it had been a good process, and we ended up in a good place um, for us in Denmark. It's also been very important that we um, that this uh, principle based process was uh, was uh, upheld. It. Um, we also have to run a business uh, behind this, uh, on top of this uh, this directive. It's important that we can 
that there, yeah, that you leave some flexibility for uh, for the banks to actually operate and adjust to some of the nitty gritty differences from from country to country. Um, and I think this is, this is stru stru uh, a, a good balance between the principles and still getting a, a, a framework where everybody can can, can see what's uh, what what applies to them. Thank you, Morten. Well, now the key question, because we have to align our agendas, is what is the timeline in front of us? Because uh, the directive has been approved, but in reality not approved. Uh, and uh, we are all waiting for publication. I think it seems to be that uh, can take longer than what we expected. I mean, I don't know, Matthias, uh, if you can help us in understanding where we are, what will, be, will happen in the coming months, because Frank has to convince his uh, group of people to work for the coming months. Okay, I'll do that without uh, hopefully boring you too much about the intricacies of the EU legislative sausage machine. But essentially, uh, what happened uh, was that there was a lot of negotiations towards the end of the mandate, which meant that the thing that intervenes typically uh, in parallel as the negotiations wind up has now happened over summer, which is the so-called legal revision, which is where uh, lawyer linguists who focus on language, they dig into it and they make sure that it reads very well. They've been doing that. Member states will tomorrow look at the final meeting, looking at these changes, and the final, final adoption uh, vote in Parliament is scheduled to take place on 9th of October. Then, going back to the fact that there's a lot of legislation that then has to be published, when that is published in the official journal, which kind of uh, sets the start of the entry into force, it'll probably be either November or December something along those lines. So it's not much of a slippage. It's roughly within the kind of uh, time frame that we had in mind. And from then on, you start counting the general kind of uh, entry into application, which then will happen, I would say, spring 2022. Well, I mean, this is, a, I think, a clear view for us because, I mean, uh, the, the steering committee and the task force will continue to work. Uh, of course, this is a sensitive discussion. So, I mean, there, is, there are a lot of emotions around this. So the steering committee yesterday decided to be very uh, careful and uh, keeping the legal expert working, I would say, in an internal uh, environment. Uh, and then when, whenever the steering committee will feel that we are able to, to share the result with a, a larger group, we, the ECBC is ready uh, to put this on the table and to show leadership um, vis-a-vis, -vis, I would say, national authorities working on this, uh, and also all our national association and uh, issue community will take uh, this work as a kind of useful instrument for their analysis. And then we will support you. I would like also to recall that the European Commission has two roles in the European Treaty. First of all, they are in charge of proposing legislation. So they normally, what they do, they propose a draft legislation that then has to be up, approved in the Council and finally in the Parliament. But they have also another task, if I'm not mistaken, which is monitoring, monitoring the implementation of the, of the directive. We have a much more beautiful name for it. But, uh, yeah. We're guardian of the treaties. Guardian of the treaties. But because, I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I got the question, I mean, but now what is the role of the European Commission? So it's very important to, to specify that there is a clear role of the European uh, Commission I would say that since we have a directive in front of us, this role is even more important because uh, the margin of maneuver for every single member state in a directive is a bit larger than a regulation. Allow me to do, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll try to be a bit simple in my analysis. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so the role of the European Commission as a coordinator of what is still there uh, and will remain there. And Matthias, you will be in charge most probably of this kind of uh, adventure for the coming months. Um, so the industry is ready to work together. Uh, and also, I think we have another challenge because, uh, as you can see, we have a lot of global members of the ECBC and everyone is looking at us as a kind of benchmark. So I'd like to raise a question on third party equivalence. Uh, maybe, I don't know if Baldwin, you can help us to... Tell us, what are the expectations of other countries implementing a, a cover bond, maybe not with a legal structure, but, but a structure uh, cover bond, and looking at us and say, what do we have to do? Because I mean, that's the question. I mean, uh, how we can be recognized by the European Commission? Yeah, well, uh, first I would like to, <clears throat> to, uh, to thank Matthias to give us some reading material uh, for Christmas. 
as usual. <laughs> um, no, but I think uh, what, what people are looking at into first in the, indeed in the European countries is to uh, the current directive and then the final final text, which uh, shouldn't change too much, and then see um, how this can be implemented and, and what kind of discretion is needed because there's still Europe is not one country, it's different countries, so different laws, different mortgages, so there will be still some minor differences, even though that uh, over the years uh, within the ECBC and with the common market, we have seen a lot of harmonization um, in Europe, but now also that you see more and more outside of Europe because the product uh, is, is copied in other countries uh, and then hopefully, and that's what we try uh, to, to strive for, that it's in, done in, in, a, in a good way and not uh, affecting the product in a negative way, which is overall the case. Um, but it also means that a lot of the countries uh, which are not part of, of Europe, for which the directive is more uh, voluntary, um, they were already already looking to the tax saying, okay, how can we align our uh, legislation or a notice or a law or framework, their programs, uh, to, to make it in line with the government uh, directive going forward. Um, but at the same time, the question will very quickly come up um, because that's the, the part which is missing is the third party equivalent. Um, yeah, because also I think it's for both sides of, uh, of, the, of the, not only the channel, but in the globe, it's, uh, it's important that there is uh, the third party equivalent for the strengths of the product, but also for the treatment of the product, which is uh, often indeed for uh, uh, Canadian or, uh, or Australian issuers, uh, the treatment of their cover bonds in, uh, for European investors but at some point also the other way around. And of course, that the product is also very comparable, um, not only as Morton says, that you can explain, okay, this is the European core bond, it ticks the boxes for the directive, uh, it's from this country, so there might be uh, some small changes. Um, but that would be the same for maybe a non-European country who wants to market the product uh, to investors going forward. And for them, it's also indeed important to say, okay, and on top of that, because of this treatment and because of the strength of the product, we get certain treatment uh, yeah, for certain investors. So I think that's where probably the next step is people are waiting for to see what the final text will be on the third party equivalents. Um, yeah, I think it's it's an important point and, and also would like to highlight in the task force, it's not only the EU issuers there or like the European Economic Area, we also have then Canadian representative or Colin Chen as, as a um, um, chairman of the global working group, because they are also like what you pointed out, they're also quite keen to make sure that if the, the cover bond directive is implemented and then the EBA is, is checking if, if the third country equivalent is there, that they have their, their cover bonds law um, ready to be, be accepted by, by, uh, by the EBA. I think that's some kind of uh, important aspects. So although they're not directly impacted by, by the cover bond directive, but they, they bear in mind and they want to get like this, this special treatment as well. So I think that's something uh, that's quite important for them. Of course, I will not raise the question of what we will be expecting on the third-party equivalents because, I mean, it can be a bit sensitive. We, are, we all know that we are getting closer to the end of October, so, I mean, uh, I will not enter this debate. Uh, but I can tell you what I tell to our global friends when they come to us and then to ask us what we have to do. Well, the answer that we give as an ECBC is, well, you can look at the Basel paper, which is, at the end of the day, and use its definition made at the global level, and it, it will be most probably something in between what you see in the Basel paper and the LCR eligibility. I mean, that's more or less the frame that we, we see. Uh, so we suggest our friends that are already working, the problem is that they want to be in time. So there are several countries already working on legislative draft and they need to have some kind of indication. We give this as a frame where they can uh, find the truth of what will be the, the third party equivalence. Uh, as you know, a legislative process doesn't last two months. Uh, even in very efficient country, I think less than three, five years, it's really challenging to have a, uh, a legislation done. So we want to be a bit on, uh, proactive here, give indication to our friends that are all here today. Uh, are we in the right track, uh, Mattia? So uh, as, as long as you can uh, give an indication, but feel free to... Uh, to tell also that uh, you cannot answer. <laughs> I'll give no indication about substance as such. I can give you indication about process, but nothing new for those who you, which I think is more or less everybody in this room who are deeply, passionately interested about covered bonds. What I will say will not come as a surprise. Um, we are now, and I think it echoes some of the themes here in the kind of phase of kind of anchoring this new framework at European level. 
And that's where we will devote our initial attentions. Uh, the third country equivalents noted a fully taken that without it, the framework from an external perspective is not complete. Even though I think that even for third country investors, the fact of having a clearer kind of more harmonized European framework at least facilitates due diligence when it comes to investing in Europe. But of course, that's the other side of it as well, which is when we go abroad, in the sense which is not there for the time being fully taken. So we will, we have a review clause, as Slavka mentioned, as picked up by uh, my fellow panelists as well. So it will, it is on the agenda. Right now, as you know, we are changing the guard in Brussels. There will be continuity, it seems. My commissioner will continue to be there with a bigger brief, bigger importance. And he believes uh, very strongly in maintaining an open Europe. And uh, so the issue is there, but exactly when or what shape it will take, I cannot say. This is the right moment also to react because I didn't try to scare anybody. I was purely, <laughs> purely referring to the content of the directive, which has all these review clauses and deadlines for report with an option to bring a legislative proposal. So there is a normal process, implementation, monitoring of implementation and post-implementation reports, which might, there is an optionality, also result in a legislative proposal. And I'm the, the least one here to indicate the content of Matthias is going to propose purely saying that this is still there, so this is a process, and on particular issues, third countries is one of them, extendable maturity is another one, and uh, uh, the third one, I can remember, is the specific area on which there needs to be evaluation about implementation, and then the overall uh, impact, and I'm sure if, uh, hopefully with our technical support, but if Commission concludes that the current directive is meeting the objectives and the market is functioning well, then I don't think you need to worry about additional harmonization. And if I have the microphone, that then maybe just to say about the implementation, what you are doing is extremely important because uh, now is the time to take the tran national transposition and implementation responsibly and take it uh, and try to uh, try to do it in a way that its uh, interpretation is as much as possible uh, harmonized. Because uh, my experience uh, working on supervisory convergence and other issues shows me that if we don't talk early enough and we leave on national, including national supervisory authorities, if we leave the interpretation purely at national level without European discussion, it many times ends up in a very, very different outcome. So uh, I very much uh, support that you also uh, discuss these issues because that can really help to, to clarify issues which... Uh, are in the directive, will be translated in a number of languages, will be put into national laws, and, and in this process, sometimes you end up with very different outcomes. Maybe, maybe just on some, some point, and I think that was also really highlighted in the steering committee and also in the task force. Um, I think everybody was quite happy to have a little bit room for national discretion. I think that's also like this, on one side, yeah, of course, you can, can completely harmonize everything, but I think everybody was also relieved to, to because the markets are not really 100% comparable. And, and I think that's the reason, I think, why, why everybody wanted to have a little bit of room for national discussion. So um, I think we, we have to find some kind of um, right balance between harmonizing and, and allowing uh, the, 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 the special situation in the various markets. And you can't really compare the Danish market to the German market or to the, to the Dutch market. They're completely different in certain areas. And therefore, having a little bit of room for, for national discretion, I think it's quite important. And I think everybody also like in the task force was highlighting, we don't want to have like a situation where we suddenly recommending some kind of complete harmonization because on purpose in the directive, and I think that was also my understanding from the European Commission, uh, on purpose, there are uh, room for national discretion. And I think we should not really try to, to over harmonize those areas. Whereas also from, from investor perspective, no real need for that. I mean, yeah, now perhaps to just to complement and respond. I mean, indeed, I mean, the cover bond directive is a balancing act between the need to achieve a sufficient degree of harmonization while remaining, re, uh, while having remaining sufficient room for kind of fitting that harmonization into an existing national context. And everything will happen in due course. What we will do now is to work with member states to ensure that the transposition goes well that we implement what is harmonized in a kind of a fully complete and conform way. And then, in due course, we will also look at how does the directive deliver what it is we wanted to deliver, which is market takeoff, 
some extent, large markets, new markets, integration is another thing. Do we see cross, will, will we see increased cross-border issues? Will we see uh, big cross-border uh, groups uh, centralizing their issues? These kind of things. We will look at that. That, of course, takes time. We first have to see how this lands and uh, give you the kind of breathing room you need to kind of put this in place and adapt to this. And then we'll see in due course but, uh, how, uh, whatever kind of complementary measures we will need to put in place. Well, all of you have a real job, but my job, which is a fake job, is to guess what you will be doing on the market side and from the institutions. And I think that I read the confirmation of uh, Vice President Dobrowski in his role as an important sign for the industry. Dobrowski was, has been always very clear on what was, uh, uh, I will say, the guidelines in implementing the directive. First of all, not create any disruption in any functioning market. Secondly, to accept a principle-based harmonization, which means that uh, there was a full respect of the, of the national models and trying to have an overarching solution. So having Valdis Dobrowski still in the same office in Brussels is making my life a bit more relaxing uh, um, because I believe that he will be absolutely uh, consistent with what was his mandate uh, before. There was a hard work of the staff of the, of the EBA and the staff of the commission. So the direction was very clear and is not changing. And as a lobbyist, you have also to read different things. If you look at the agenda of the Finnish presidency, the, the agenda of the Finnish uh, uh, presidency is concentrating in and the finalization of the implementation of the Capital Markets Union. What does it mean? That we have to have a focus on cover bonds, maybe I have the hope that the European Secure Notes will remain in the pipeline as has been said in Riga a few months ago. And also there is a role to implement the energy efficiency debate in this scheme. Because it's true, I mean, like the cover bonds has all the hooks to have a strong energy efficiency touch. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. But we would like to know also how regulators, central bank, will be discussing uh, how the prudential framework in Europe can absorb a sustainability debate. Because this is, I think, fundamental for our banks. Uh, I think that most of our banks are already thinking or have already issued green cover bonds, ESG cover bonds. Even in Korea, they just issue ESG cover bonds. So we are ready to accept this challenge. And I think that we need also some indication on your side of what are the macro prudential characteristics that we have to capture in a prudential framework. Uh, I think that both of you are working on this. I don't know if Slavka or uh, Matthias, I mean, how you want to react to this? Uh... Um, on the macro prudential, I mean, suddenly that has certain connotations and uh, I will perhaps not go into the macro prudential aspects as such, but on the broader macro themes, which I think you're alluding to too. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, climate change, the climate crisis, and sustainable finance. You saw yesterday, for those of you who follow Brussels politics, the prominence that took when a new team was presented. We'll have a vice president who will lead the Green New Deal. And uh, if you look at the mission letter that my commissioner, Vice President Dobrov Dombrovsky, has got, sustainable finance is very, very prominent there too. So everything that touches upon sustainable will be on the top of the agenda from now on. If it hasn't already been there, it probably was already, but it will certainly increase in importance. And I think when I, CMU, I mean, CMU is a, uh, a bureaucratic name, perhaps, for something which is quite basic at the end of the day. It is to create diversity of financial intermediation channels in Europe. We have a system that is largely dependent on bank financing. We want to make it more diverse. But what is interesting about this area of covered bonds is that actually there's no dichotomy between these two. That is probably often quite simplistic, but it has to be one or the other, or one at the expense of the other. But actually the two work very well, and I think the covered bond file is a good example of how you can leverage bank financing with a degree of markets. And that I think is also interesting to see how you can then leverage a similar technique for other areas. You mentioned uh, SME financing, BSN, that is on our agenda as well. Uh, 
the vice president uh, early this year made it very clear that he wants to look at this very seriously. Now, when the new team is in place, we will continue to do so on the basis of the work that has already been done by the EBA. And there is a review clause foreseen, the exact timing of which remains to be decided. So, on the topic of sustainability, this is uh, very important also on, on our agenda. So, how, how to say the direction in, in, this, uh, in this setup? So, uh, that if you are asking about uh, a lower risk rate for, for green bonds, that's not the debate I would like to have at this stage. So, what we see at this stage is, is important, is for uh, market participants to understand, okay, based on EU taxonomy, with the reference to the EU taxonomy, okay, this is long-term sustainable activity. So whatever I'm doing, that's my reference against the target or where I want to get. And then uh, if I am a bank, okay, uh, if I'm a bank, so I can look on that from the perspective, okay, so I have some environmental risk, climate change, and all, all of that. Let's wait and see, and I will see how much capital I will need in 15 years from now to cover it. Or... I can take a proactive approach and say, okay, so this is coming on me. If the global agreements are actually going to be implemented by my government, then it means that there will be restrictions, taxations, uh, bans, and all this stuff will be impacting my customers and then impacting my profitability and, and my, uh, my uh, financial stability. So I can take proactive approach and under, of course, under uncertainty about the future and scenarios which can happen, I can start already working in my business strategy on transition with my customers and help the direction to redirect them into more sustainable activities and finance the more sustainable activities, which then hopefully also be less risky because that's economically more stable activities. So this is the debate we prefer to have at this stage with the sector. And when it comes to the bond side, of course, there is a EU green bond standard published by the TEG. Uh, I have been personally uh, part of that working group, but more in an observer role as the public authority. But I think it's a very good uh, starting point. And uh, uh, with, with that direction, again, uh, we are what we think is important to really create good green market and green market opportunities and, uh, of course, to have good incentives to have, I don't know, uh, common structural features of these products, like, for example, Green Bond Standard, having uh, other commonalities, uh, maybe to have some premium segment eventually of uh, green covered bonds, as we did on the green bonds, to really work on the good green products, which can help uh, to get the market going and, and meet with these two objectives. So this is the debate we like to have. So how do you understand your, your current uh, exposure to risk? What is your strategy, where you want to get? And is that strategy a mitigation of your potential ESG risk, which are coming 10 years from now? And through that, we will hopefully get to the more. But of course, if we have good data and we have specific mandate, which is due only 2025, uh, if we have good data and we can prove that... Uh, uh, within the capital framework, uh, the green assets are performing differently than non-green assets, we will be more than happy to suggest that there is a justification for differentiated prudential treatment. But that's not the starting point. That can come later. Yeah. Uh, allow me to pass a message to my people, in the sense that uh, IMAP and IDAP are trying exactly to do this. So we are very grateful to have the 48 banks in the pilot. I think it's very important because those 48 banks are actually looking for what they need to justify what actually Vice President Dobrovsky uh, said to us in February last year. So if there is an evidence and we have an IT protocol, so a tracking system in our balance sheet that can demonstrate that we are a better risk profile, we can have access to a different prudential treatment. Uh, I think this is a completely different story from a green supporting factor. It's a completely uh, risk-sensitive approach that we want to bring in this industry, which is not creating any kind of market disruption. What we are simply saying in our story, that if you have a better LGD or loan-to-value, 
And if you improve your probability of default because you have more disposable income, you should be treated in a better way. That's our simple story. Uh, so I want to make clear that uh, I think the ball is on our field now because the European institutions are ready to take action if they are able to see evidence. Uh, we cannot do this alone. I mean, for example, I, I see uh, Abi is here. Abi has organized uh, a meeting in Rome with all the Ministry uh, of uh, Finance and uh, Development where they want to create a support unit to EMAP and EDAP to help the 10 Italian banks in, in the pilot phase to support this initiative and provide data as soon as possible. So we are in between national authorities, market and European institutions because now I think it's really the moment to take action and to provide concrete evidence. They cannot change things like this. We have done this for the SME factor. I think, don't think that Basel will allow us for a second time to, uh, to, to change something simply for a political reasons. Um, so I, I think that there is some work that has to be done. I invite all the banks in this room to join the pilot phase, to come to Venice, because there is a lot of work to be done and we need to provide something to them. 30 seconds. So the EBA is also having out a consultation paper on the loan ordination guidelines, and please pay attention to those. The consultation is running uh, still for a few weeks. Uh, there we are already uh, proposing provisions, very high level, but I understand the industry is complaining anyway, uh, high level provisions on expectations for uh, uh, starting to evaluate uh, ESG factors when ordinating new loans. But this is all very connected because uh, uh, it's on banks to really start having these discussions with their uh, customers and then being able to start collecting this type of information, many times qualitative, but uh, this is one step in the process to support the attention of, of uh, banks on uh, sustainability in loan ordination, because that's the newly ordinating, or, ordinated loans where we can really start collecting uh, data. While on the existing portfolio, we are more looking on exposure to, let's say, climate risk and what to do with it going forward. But for the newly ordinated, this is our idea. Please start incorporating this into your loan policies and start collecting uh, data to the best knowledge uh, you have at this stage about, about the topic. Thank you. So I think it's, um, we, we are preparing the response as the EMF and uh, the Legal Affairs Committee is collecting the response. We will be in time for the deadline. We will have also some discussion on bilateral basis with EBA. So if you have any views please let us know because we are more than happy to act as a hub and provide a unique answer to the European institution. We are getting closer to the end of the panel and um, Matthias will give us a gift, or actually the parliament uh, by Christmas. Uh, uh, the secretary of the parliament will most probably publish the final uh, directive. Um, well, we have all to write a letter to Santa Claus. Okay, I ask you to... Uh, tell us one wish, what you expect from the European Union institution, uh, Morten. I would like to ask uh, Zlavka to tell one wish to the market, a message, what you would like to, to see from our side as a European Cover Bond Council, and the same question for you. So it will be one point, you have only one wish. Um, I don't know, let's start with Denmark. It's the happiest country in the world, so... That's a difficult one. Um, I, I think I'll start with, with, with something that Slavka has said before, uh, because you mentioned that, uh, that one of the things that you were a little bit concerned about was, uh, was the joint funding. Uh, it's no secret that one of the countries that have joint funding models in place is Denmark. Um, and not so much for our sake, but I think for something that Matthias mentioned, nam namely uh, a higher degree of integration, I think it's something that is really that has a lot of merit because it allows banks to consolidate their covered bond issues across borders. Um, it is notoriously difficult to fund mortgage portfolios across borders, but some of the stuff in the joint funding models uh, allow that. Um, so, so one wish is to, um, to actually uh, make sure that this, this will work. So I will link it with what I already said. So one wish would be that the transposition and implementation is done the way, that there is no more for Matthias in uh, three, five years from now to 
propose next step so that really it's success at this stage and there is no that the market is really working and there is no need to harmonize more perfect um i would say uh, publish the directive as expected so no further surprises <laughs> And maybe, uh, if possible, include something on the third-party equivalents, and then and then leave it a bit to the market to uh, to get used to it. Yeah. Okay. As as moderator of the um, um, of the task force, I think what I will hope for is that the uh, national regulator um, listen to the market and 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 not really that everyone goes in a certain direction, but really um, really listen to 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 the feedback. But but what the market really sees, because in my view, the cover bond market is one of the few markets really which has proved during the crisis that it works well. And, and I think you see the benefit of the directive, don't get me wrong, but I think there's also risk that in certain areas, if you implement the directive, there could be some, some areas where it could be overdone. And I think there's also risk to, to, to over-harmonize. And therefore, it would be great to, to use the, the national discretion, which is there in the directive. Okay, if you pursue your Christmas analogy, analogy, I would say that as our gift is at least initially destined to member states, I would hope that they open the package with care and caution and that they take good care of it when they implement it on national level. Echoing the themes here, uh, the proof lies in the pudding and a lot of the pudding you can only eat it if it's been transposed well. So we are ready to help and uh, ready to have all the assistance and the very good work that you guys are doing as well in kind of helping in that respect. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as a moderator, I don't have a wish. I cannot answer with uh, a commitment to do our work till the very end and to make sure that uh, no one will ask for more harmonization in three years' times. I think that we have a fantastic group of people, the best legal experts that we have in Europe on cover bonds, that are working already very hard. And it's an honor to guide them uh, towards the right direction. And we will uh, implement the directive in a smooth way making sure that all of us can continue to do business in the proper way. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and uh, all the European institutions for their excellent work and for being here today once again uh, to discuss with us and to find a way how we can move forward and build a bit better the Capital Markets Union and finalize the Capital Markets Union. Thank you all and thank you for the panel. <laughs>